We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. Good afternoon. My name is Pastor Stephen Capaldo from Ikad Unity Ministries in New York City. Thank you for listening. Um, today I'll be talking about the spiritual gifts and trying to um, maybe clarify some points uh, about how, how we view them and how we work with them and the, the, what they produce, you know, what they, what they give us. Uh, but before we do that, we'll uh, go to uh, the Father in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this day and thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for the, your love for us and the love that we have for each other as a unified body of believers in your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to watch out for us in the days ahead. Be with us for those who are traveling, traveling mercies, for those who are experiencing different forms of uh, uh, oppression or different uh, undergoing different problems in life with family members or at work or whatever the problems are. You know what they are. We lift these, uh, these people and their issues up to you, Father, you know what they need, and we ask that you provide what they need, and that they have the grace to receive it, and then humble themselves where necessary to receive it. And we thank you for this uh, chance to bring forth a message today, and we uh, ask that your blessing will be upon it, and it will be edifying to the people who will be listening to it, and these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, I'll be reading out of uh, 1 Corinthians 12 on uh, the use of spiritual gifts. And um, I would just like to make some comments about, uh, you know, what, what they are and, uh, and how possibly they are used and applied. And I, I think sometimes there are some, uh, there, there's some confusion about the different gifts and uh, there are different controversies about them. And, and I think we want as much as possible to try to develop uh, some kind of a unified position as, mu as much as we can, as much as we can put ourselves in agreement on what the scripture says and what the scripture means, uh, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, anything from God is spiritual. Anything from God is supernatural. Anything that God gives you to use in your lifetime, you, you could call it a spiritual gift. And there are some, some uh, uh, specific manifestations of that spiritual gift. And then there are some uh, specific functions that God gives us uh, where we can operate, that we can operate in, and that, that's also a gift from God. So anything from above is spiritual, it's from God, and uh, you know, I, I think we just want to keep the, the, the definitions and the, 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 you know, the academic uh, wrangling over all these things, we want to keep that down to a minimum, and we want people to know that you know, God has given them gifts, he wants them to use the gifts, and these gifts uh, manifest themselves in, in different ways. And basically what I'll be starting and finishing with is to say that, uh, that, that spiritual gifts can be a manifestation or spiritual gifts can be an operation of some kind. And as I go through 1 Corinthians 12, I'll explain uh, more what that means. Uh, so starting in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. So Paul is saying right now to this Corinthian church, which did have some problems of division, you know, it was not... Uh, uh, it, it was not... Um, let's say the the most highly spiritual of the churches that Paul, uh, you know, was involved with. Uh, there were some problems there. There there were uh, disagreements, and you know there was uh, there was some degree of division. So um, that's that that's just uh, just by way of background, just so that you you know that as you go through Corinthians, it's it's uh, there are two two books, and each one is fairly lengthy, and I think that kind of gives you a clue. That the Holy Spirit is saying that you know there's a lot of work to be done in this church. You know this is this is why He inspired such long uh, books. You know in Corinthians, and then some of the other ones are not so long because those churches uh, quite possibly were more you know into the Word and more you know advancing in in, uh, in in the knowledge of the truth and and advancing in grace. You know more more maybe than the congregation in uh, Corinth was. I do not want you to be unaware. So. Uh, you know, uh, Paul is saying, you know, uh, uh, le learn, edu educate yourselves, learn what it is that the Holy Spirit uh, has for you. What is the Holy Spirit and what is the Holy Spirit giving you to do and, and what tools are available and what does he want you to do with those tools. You know that when you were pagans, when you were unbelievers, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. So you weren't really concentrating on the living God, you were concentrating on things. 
you were concentrating on you know idol worship you were concentrating on uh, gods that uh, you know appeared in the form of you know trees or rocks or, or whatever that's this is how they manifested themselves nature worship instead of worshiping the the, uh, the, the living Lord God you know, Jesus Christ therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So it's only if you truly um, uh, meant your confession of faith that you've believed in Jesus Christ for victory in love over sin, death, and bondage. If you've, it, It's only if you've meant, meant that can you be speaking by the Holy Spirit and truly saying and believing, not just mouthing the words, but truly saying and believing that Jesus is Lord. And you're not you're in the flesh, you're not speaking by the Spirit if you say Jesus is accursed, that Jesus is not God, or he's not the Son of God, or he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, or he didn't live the sinless life, the, 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 or he didn't, you know, die for us. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, but the same Spirit. So don't get all hung up, I mean, all of these gifts uh, are from the same Spirit, the Spirit of God, and uh, all of these gifts... Uh, are good for the work of God, and every man has his portion. You know, no one can have every gift, but you know, God gives you the gifts that He wants to give you, and uh, and and sometimes He gives them in large measure, sometimes He gives them in small measure, sometimes He, He, he might not give a gift to one person, but He gives it to another person. So uh, the, this the, the point is that we are not to be jealous. We are to be grateful for what He has bestowed upon us individually. We are to be grateful for what He has bestowed upon others to them. Because that means then that we can all work together as one unified body of Christ. So that's a beautiful thing when it works. The problem is we see it not working very much. You know, in a lot, in a lot of places in Christianity, it doesn't work very much. But it's it's because people are jealous. Really, they don't. They're they're uh, they see what someone else has and they want what someone else has instead of rejoicing in what it is that God has graciously bestowed upon them for them to use in their spiritual walk, for them to use in their relationship with the Lord, and for them to use uh, in being uh, under the mentorship of the Holy Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And ministries, that's anything. I mean, Akkad Unity Ministries is an example of a ministry, but you know, if you're called to use whatever gifts God has given you to uh, to uh, preach the gospel in the streets, you know, that's that, that's a very good calling. Or uh, God, God may call you to be a witness in a soup kitchen or a hospital or a prison. And you know, don't, don't ever look down on those callings because they're not a, some big church, you know, on TV. I mean, don't ever look down on those callings. Uh, don't ever look down on somebody, you know, helping helping the poor or helping the infirm. You know, p people who have different uh, different illnesses or different dis disabilities. Uh, people who go out into the streets and try to talk talk about Jesus Christ. I mean, th those are all ministries. Those are all wonderful ministries. And it's not, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I want a certain type of position in a church, or I want to pastor a church, or you know, I want I want something. You know, I want to go into media. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't a place to do those things, but you know, stop and think and pray, and you know, where where does God want you to be? And don't don't ever make light of someone else's ministry, or don't ever reject a ministry for yourself because you think it's not such a uh, such a great ministry, or you, or somehow you know you're worthy of more, you deserve more. No, we deserve, you know, what it is that God has for us, and we just have to humble ourselves enough to receive that which God has for us, you know, and. We don't know, for example, what will happen with the uh, Unity Ministries. We we know that we're we're uh, moving somewhere. We don't know what doors God will open. Maybe it will just be YouTube. Maybe it will be a home Bible study. We don't we don't know. We, we don't know. There might be something more, or maybe not. You know, we just we just want to be humble before the Lord. That's that's what we're really trying to do, and just just let the doors open, or you know, if certain doors don't open, they don't open. And, and, you know, we don't want to make a big deal out of this, and we don't want to be, you know, arguing with God and striving with God. And, and, and you know, we've been, we've been going through uh, uh, something trying to figure out, you know, when, when we move, we're moving next year, and trying to figure out exactly, you know, where we're going to be and how we're going to be there. We've been kind of wrestling with an issue the last couple of weeks. And we finally said, you know, it doesn't really matter how God is going to do it, you know, what place he's going to pick out for us to be and you know what type of place it's going to be and how we're going to be there you know in what way we're going to be there uh, you know are we going to own it are we going to rent it i mean what are going to be the circumstances of it 
you know, that doesn't really matter. You know, God has the place selected. We just have to walk in that. And so we discover it. And so we're not, you know, striving and fighting and running around like chickens with our heads cut off. You know, we just have to rest and be still and know that he is God. And, uh, and that's it. God will direct our paths. He's directing us, you know, from, from New York to Rhode Island, and he'll direct us to the just a, a fine place, you know, the perfect place that he has for us. And, and more is being revealed about that, and then eventually we'll know where we're going to be, you know, more specifically when, when we get to Rhode Island. But, you know, we have to just, we, we just have to learn how to relax, and that's all I can, uh, I can urge you to do as well, is just to learn how to relax in the Lord and don't really don't worry so much, you know, don't worry so much about the, all of these details of life, you know, we learned about the details of life, and quite quite rightly, we, 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 there should be some discussion of the details of life, because we worry about them too much, you know, and we have to learn how not to do that, be still and know that I am God. When we say that, you know, do we believe it? That's, that's the thing. So there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord, there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So whatever it is that God has for you, there are, there are varieties of effects. You know, you do something and it has this effect or that effect. And whatever it is you do, you know, it'll have a different effect in your in your life than it might have in someone else's life. And so, so it's just, you know, the way ministries actually perform and, you know, what they actually achieve through the grace of God, it, it, it's just, it, it's up to God. And each ministry, uh, you know, will be a little different. And each ministry will have a different effect on the environment around the community in which it has been established. But it's the same God still, at the same time, who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we're given the manifestation of the Spirit. And, you know, this this is where I think that, um, you know, what, what, what Paul is going to develop here is that there are different manifestations. Now, we, we've, uh, much of Christianity teaches that the manifestation means that you're given only one gift. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that's the best interpretation of it because a, a manifestation could be of several things. There's nothing grammatically or otherwise that says that a manifestation has to be of only one thing. It can be a manifestation of several things. And, and the, the, the really supernatural manifestations that, that, that are spiritual gifts are things like, you know, wisdom and knowledge and faith and prophecy and discernment and healing and miracles and tongues and interpretation of tongues. Those are the nine manifestations. And of course, there are different viewpoints as to, you know, what exactly they mean and do all of them still exist. And you'll we'll go through the, uh, through the passages. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's verse 7, verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit and to another the word of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. Now, the, the word of wisdom, the word, uh, and this is the MacArthur Study Bible, which is an, is an excellent tool, the word indicates a speaking gift. In the New Testament, wisdom is most often used of the ability to understand God's word and his will, and to skillfully apply that understanding to life. So, knowledge is grasping the meaning of the truth, and wisdom is more like, you know, applying it but they're both manifestations of the spirit of the of the same spirit and you you would want both right i mean if you're a believer in jesus christ you should be you hoping you know give me not only knowledge but give me wisdom So we have a wisdom through the Spirit to one, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. And this is, this is someone uh, you know, who typically would do a lot of you know, intercessory prayer and, and uh, just, just who is very strong, in, uh, very strong in faith, but everyone has a measure of faith. I mean, the, these things, I, I don't see why these things uh, you know, would be limited, you know, one, one to a customer kind of uh, uh, gift, you know, I, I think, you know, God is very generous in his gifts, and I think if, if, if you are faithful and you desire something, if you desire to know the things of God, you know, God will give you wisdom and knowledge and faith, you know, and these, they, these can be used, you know, for uh, God's purposes, and God can use them in very mighty ways, which will be very uh, amazing and, you know, have a great impact on the environment, but you have to just be patient, and you have to be faithful, and you have to be humble, and you have to listen, and you have to pray. And uh, we'll all get the measure that, uh, that, that, that we want to have if we're just patient and faithful. So 
wisdom is the application of the word, and the knowledge is really the understanding of the word, learning of the word, and, and the faith is that you 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 believe you you believe that Jesus Christ is who He says He is, and you believe that you know God is taking care of all the needs that you have in your life, and you you uh, believe that you're saved by grace. And uh, you know that God loves you, and you, you know you you just believe that you have this relationship with God, and that it's it's your um, obligation, your duty as a born again believer to execute the Great Commission and to share that with other people. You know to make disciples, to help people get reborn of the Spirit, and and you believe that that's that that's what you're here to do. You have faith in that. So to another faith by the same spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one spirit. Now, uh, here's where we get into some uh, some controversy: is that the the uh, as we get into uh, healing, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, etc. So the healing and miracles, um, these are these these were gifts that were especially prevalent when uh, uh, Jesus and the apostles were. Um, we're on the earth. Um, there aren't in the Old Testament, and since Christ was here the first time, there aren't a lot of recorded, um, especially in the Old Testament, there aren't a lot of recorded uh, cases of, uh, of physical healings. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't happen. But uh, in the scripture that we have, the emphasis on miracles and healings really was with the uh, with Jesus and with the apostles, just to make the point that this this uh, that that this exists, and we should have faith that God can do miracles and that God can heal. Now, I, I think really the question really is faith. I mean, miracles happen every day. I mean, it's a miracle that you get up every day, right? You know, that you're 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 alive, you know, and you you can walk, and you know, you you have a place to go to work or you to, to go to school or you know, you have money to buy groceries. I mean, there are a lot of things that really are miracles. I mean, if you really have enough faith, you can see miracles all around you, and, and you and, and you can experience healing, you know? And sometimes, yes, people do fall ill, and, and sometimes they, they do die of certain conditions, but it's, it's, the, it's the will of God as well. You know, God knows how long we're going to live. And I think that the, the, the issue is with uh, healing and miracles, I think the issue is... It, really not whether or not man can do these things. The issue is, do we have faith in miracles and, and healing? That, you know, God really is capable of giving us a life of miracles and a life of healing if our faith is strong enough. It's because our faith is weak that we don't experience the healing and the miracles that we could experience. And I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that we often make the issue of healing and miracles is, well, uh, was man involved in it? Well, you know, uh, the, the point that we should be uh, focusing on is that God is always involved in healing and miracles. We just have to believe by faith that these things are possible. With faith, all things are possible, right? With God, all things are possible. So it's that that's the issue of healing and miracles, not are, are people involved in actually healing people. No, God, God is the one we should be focused on as being the author of healing and miracles, and we have to uh, make it real by faith. That's the way we make these, these things real, is, is by uh, continuously being in the Word and believing the Word and applying it to life experience. That gives us the discernment and that gives us the truth in the soul that allows us to really receive healing and miracles. And uh, um, that's, that, 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 that's really the, the connection, is, is faith. To another, the effecting of miracles. To another, prophecy, which is uh, you know a, a form of teaching. Now, it isn't uh, prophesying about end time events. That was done in the Old Testament. Those prophets that prophesied the end time events, they they, they did uh, cease to do that. Now, pro prophesying can be very uh, you know a, a specific type of teaching. So I, I, I'm not saying that it's impossible to be prophetic in your teaching, but the actual the prophets who did the prophesying of, of end time events. When we're talking about end time events, though. Those, those prophets existed before, and then uh, once we had the completed uh, written Bible, then, I mean, they, there, there wasn't any more prophesying of that type to be done. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits, that's uh, discernment, and you should be praying for discernment. I mean, if you really want to understand the Word of God, you have to... Uh, 
understand it in a way that it's rightly divided, um, that it's rightly discerned. And, you know, if you see uh, passages, uh, you know, about stoning people and plucking out your eyes, and I love to call those, I love to talk about those examples that you, that you know that you're not commanded to go and pluck out your eye or stone somebody. You have to rightly discern and rightly divide. Now, I'm not saying the Bible isn't to be understood literally in a sense, but you have to understand not only what something says, but what something means. And, and I think here my training in languages does actually help, because there's what things say and there's what things mean. And we, we, what do we really want to know about the Bible? We want to know more than what the Bible says. Now, don't get all upset when I say that. Even more than what the Bible says is we want to know what the Bible means by what it says. That's the rightly dividing part. We want to know what it means by what it says. So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to a literal view of the Bible, but I think we also have to, uh, you know, take, take a more spiritual view. Is what, what is the point that God is trying to get at by telling a story a certain way and by using some images which maybe are not, are not the most relevant to this day and age? Because we have to understand the Bible in the era in which it was, uh, in which it was uh, written and, you know, what, how, how the world was then. And, you know, certain things are not exactly this way now, but there might be a lesson or something that we can get out of that, even though you know world uh, situations and you know conditions in the world have changed, and people don't live exactly the same way, and stoning isn't done in too many places anymore, and you know that that type of thing. We have to rightly divide the word of truth, and that. And so I'm, I'm not fighting against the literal understanding of the Bible, but I am saying you have to understand what the Bible uh, means by what it says. Uh, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. Um, now, you know, it, it's, it's possible that people did worship, you know, were given in certain limited cases uh, in the book of Acts, people were given some kind of supernatural utterance to, uh, to, to witness to people in their language, even though the person doing the witnessing didn't speak that language in the natural realm. That's, that, that's a possibility, but really the, uh, that, that's kind of a narrow definition of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Uh, uh, Tongue, tongues are uh, tongues are truth, and you know sometimes truth, if it's taught in a certain way, like in parables, it can be difficult to, to to understand. You know, even if you do speak the language of the parable, it might be difficult to understand what it means. So you need someone to explain it. You need someone to interpret it, and uh, that that really is you know people operating in the same language and then having certain things explained in the same language so that there's no confusion. I think that's a much closer uh, definition of what, to, what the word is trying to get at in talking about tongues and interpretation of tongues. The idea of praying in uh, a language that you don't understand or praying things in, that, that, that you don't understand in gibberish, you can do that in your private prayer life if you like. But congregational worship is not supposed to be confusing. It's not supposed to divide people. If you want to pray a certain way in your own private life and you really think that that brings you closer to God, I, it, it doesn't work for me, but I'm not saying it wouldn't work for you, you know, if you, if you want to do that. I mean, that's, that, that's up to you. But I think, really, I would encourage you to think about what is really meant by tongues and interpretation of tongues. And I think that speaking speaking, uh, giving different principles and aspects of truth, this is really the, 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 the tongues of God, the tongues of fire, the, the fire that refines fallen man, the tongues of God. And the interpretation of tongues would be the ability to explain those principles of truth that, uh, uh, that, that are the tongues of fire that may be difficult to understand uh, because you have not been exposed to that before. So those are really some of the manifestations of the Spirit. Um, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized spiritually, baptized into one body. I'm not saying you can't be water baptized, uh, to, to show, you know, as a witness that you have already been saved, you can do that. But this is the spiritual baptism into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, doesn't matter who you are, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. 
So we were all made to drink of one spirit. It's like water is a, a symbol of life. So you drink of one spirit. You can drink, literally, you can drink. Now it's clear, it's water. It's not vodka. You're probably thinking, some of, some of you are probably thinking it's vodka because I did some lessons in Russian, but it's water. I do occasionally like vodka, but th this is water. I wouldn't drink vodka when I was teaching. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. So you get that. Every, every part of the body is important. Every member of the body of Christ is important. You don't have a whole body unless you have all the parts. And all the parts, you know, ready for service and functioning and, you know, doing the, doing the right things to be, to, to be whole, you know, getting, letting God work through you. So everything's important. I mean, just think of your own physical body, how the different parts work together. Well, that's the way it is spiritually. So this is, this is a, this is a metaphor, like we were talking about the last time, you know, that's, uh, that Christ, uh, the body of Christ is a body of believers, just as the, as the human body is a body of parts that all have to work together for, for the good of the whole. That's the way it is with the body of Christ. So that's why, you know, unity is a simple concept, and, you know, we talk a lot about unity, and people make a big deal about unity, or they say, oh, well, unity, of course, you know, anybody can talk about unity. Okay, anybody can talk about unity, live by unity, understand the principle, and live by unity. That, that's the whole point. I mean, you know, we can talk until the cows come home, you know, about the, how, how wonderful unity is, but until we understand what it really means, and we integrate those principles into actual behavior, into actual life experience, and how we conduct ourselves, the type of integrity and character that we have, and how we treat other people, and how we love, and how we serve, we can't really talk about unity. I mean, it's just, it's a nice word, but it doesn't mean anything until you do something. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? Well, you need the different parts, you need the different people. But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas, whereas our more presentable members have no, no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body. That's it. And what, what we think isn't important, you know, in God's eyes sometimes that's extremely important. And, and uh, you know, what we think is so important, in God's eyes it might be the other way around. You know, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. So we have to be humble to realize that what we think is important is not always so important to God. And what we think is more important, if we think A is more important than B, I, I'll guarantee you God's probably thinking that B is more important than A. He's probably thinking the opposite. If, you, if you're so sure that one is more important than another, if one person is more important than another, God's almost certainly thinking the other way around. So, you know, it's not, we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We should be just, uh, you know, learning how to be humble before the Lord, you know, just, uh, you know, pray and study and, you know, ask for forgiveness and, uh, you know, ask for the, the power and the strength to love other people and forgive them and, and, and just serve and, and be a community, be a community of believers available to people who don't believe, but available also to edify with each other those of us who do believe. Uh, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You know, my joy is your joy and my pain is your pain. You know, that's, that's really the way it is. And I, I don't mean it in the sense of, uh, you know, I feel your pain. No, but, uh, but really, we, we should understand, you know, and we should empathize. We should sympathize with, with people who are going through things. And sometimes we can't really help them very much. I mean, that's, that's the thing. You, you, 
We're not all called to solve everyone else's problems, but we can empathize and we can pray. And then in certain situations, we will be called to do specific things to help people. Now you are Christ's body, and individually members of it. So you're an individual, and you're a member of the whole. And God has appointed, now that you're a body, and you're in union, you have unity, now he's appointed, you know, he's, he's, he's explained to you what the manifestations are, and he's explained to you that you are one body, and now he's giving you more the specific things to do. He says he appointed in the church, and we read of it in Ephesians as well, first apostles, second prophets, and I think the script, the scriptural evidence, if you compare verses like, I think it's 2 Corinthians 12.12 12 and Ephesians 2.20, but there are verses, if you correlate them, the, the, uh, the apostles as such, the actual office of apostle, uh, there were 12 of them plus uh, Paul who replaced Judas, and, and really scripturally, uh, that actual title, I, I think really the evidence is there that it doesn't exist as such, although you do run into people who are totally convinced that they are apostles, and, and, that, and that's between them and God, I'm not, I'm not going to criticize or judge them, but, but if you really want to go by the scripture, I, th I think that the evidence suggests to me that the apostles and the, the end time prophets have already done their thing. And then uh, just uh, teachers, uh, we should all we should all be teachers. But these are the these are the functions or the operations uh, of the gifts, right? Gifts of and, and there may be gifts of healings in some way, things that you can do or say to someone that uh, you know helps them heal in some area. It may not be from a some some big major disease, but you can help heal them through what you say and what you do, which which does create a miracle. Helps administration, various kinds of tongues, various principles that you can present to people. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. The greater gifts, the greater gifts are the ones that God wants you to have, that God designed you to have some of these gifts and implement them be together in the body and witness the manifestation of the gifts and be a witness of that to the world as you execute the Great Commission. And I'll give you your verses, your 316, so you can do that and then we'll close. Uh, uh, in, the, in the different languages, I'll give you John 3.16, so you can think about your witnessing on the Great Commission. Ибо так возлюбил Бог мир, что отдал Сына Своего Единородного, дабы всякий, верующий в Него, не погиб, но имел жизнь вечную. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, uniquely born Son, so that everyone who believes in Him would not die, but would have eternal life. Car Dieu a tant aimé le monde qu'il a donné son Fils unique, afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse pas, mais qu'il est la vie éternelle. Pour que de telle manière a mon Dieu sa mundo, qui a dado à son Hijo unique et non, pour que tout aquel qui en elle crée, ne se perda, mais tenga vida éternelle. And Father, we just thank you for this time we've had together, and thank you for this very uh, short uh, view of the spiritual gifts, and we thank you for some insights into that, and we, we pray that it will be a blessing and a notification to those who hear it, and we ask that you be with us in the days ahead. We thank you for everything you do for us, and uh, we just want you to know how much we love you and how much we appreciate your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you very much for listening, and thank you, Betsy.